Yes, Ryan. Yeah. Uh, actually, I'd prefer if you uh, unmute yourself if you have a question or a doubt because it might be hard to like uh, change my window during the talk. So, uh, I mean, if you cannot, you can surely just put it in the chat box and uh, Rahil will inform me when he sees any doubt or question on the chat box. Okay, so uh, I'll start presenting my screen then. One second. So I I hope my screen is visible right now. Is it? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So yeah, in today's talk, I'll mainly deal with uh, extending some familiar notions introduced in real analysis. Uh, a course that you all are currently doing to, and I'll try to extend it to a more general setting uh, and I'll uh, it'll mainly deal with some basic notions that are fundamental to that allow one to perform analysis on R or R and such like uh, convergence and continuous functions etc. So this will first involve having to take a closer look into certain fundamental properties of R, which allow us to define these notions that are fundamental, such as convergence, continuity, etc. So to do this, we'll first look at the two familiar definitions of convergence and continuity that you must have come across in the real uh, in the analysis one course. So let's start with con something. Yeah, let's start with convergence. All right. So given a sequence of real numbers, so let's say our sequence is given by uh, a n. So a1, a2, and henceforth of real numbers. We say that the sequence converges to a. We say that the sequence can oh okay it's strange yeah right we say that the sequence converges to a which we write appropriately with limit 10 tends to infinity a n goes to a if and only if for any epsilon greater than zero there is some delta greater than zero so that so that, sorry, not a delta, the doing convergence, my bad. So for any epsilon greater than the zero, there should exist a natural number n, capital N, so that a n minus a, the, uh, the modulus of that difference is less than epsilon for all n greater than or equal to n. So essentially, this definition is stating that after a certain point in the sequence, we have that once we have set how close we want our sequence to be to the limiting point, uh, we can find a number or point in the sequence after which all the elements in the sequence are that close to that limiting point that uh, we want it to converge to. So again, similarly, if we define, uh, if we consider the definition for the continuity of a function, that second, yeah. So uh, a real valued function f from an interval i to r, 
is said to be continuous at a point C in the domain if and only if for any epsilon greater than zero there exists some delta greater than zero so that x belonging to this delta neighborhood of c which is c minus delta c plus delta will imply that f of x belongs to the epsilon neighborhood of uh, this thing uh, of f of c so f c minus delta f c plus epsilon so essentially both these definitions have one same theme behind them if something gets close to one thing its counterpart gets close to whatever we want it to get close to and both of these rely on that measure of closeness and this is what we will take advantage of to generalize these notions so here both these notions of closeness are governed by this statement in the first one it is mod an minus a less than epsilon and in the second one it is this thing right so over here when we talk about closeness we rely on a measure of distance so here we take advantage of the natural distance that r, r gives us and that is namely d from r cross r to r given by d of x comma y equal to mod x minus y this is the natural distance that r is equipped with uh, yeah so having having been equipped with this it allows us to do a great deal of analysis and it allows us to define the notions of convergence and continuity because it gives an inherent definition of closeness it defines how close any two points in r are how far they are and uh, like it also defines all the open sets in terms of open intervals so it uh, so as an added it gives the neighborhoods around the points and how cl uh, how close each neighborhood has to be with another one for these uh, things such as continuity and convergence to take place so so far we have dealt with a standard distance on r given by this mod x mod of x minus y so we might rewrite the above two definitions in terms of just the distance function so to write it formally if we say that d is a distance function from r cross r to r uh, which is given by d of x comma y is equal to mod x so mod x minus y yeah oh i see uh, yeah i think uh, i did it yeah so with this we'll try to reformulate the definitions of continuity and convergence with this uh, having looked at the fact that it's actually a natural distance that allows us to uh, define such notions so instead if we start if we denote the natural distance on uh, r with capital d oh i see one more person is trying to hear yeah. okay so then we proceed to reformulate the definition of convergence again so convergence will again be defined as we say that limit n tends to infinity of n is a if for any epsilon greater than 0 there exists a natural number n such that after a point in the sequence we have the distance of 
a n comma a is less than epsilon for all n greater than or equal to n so again we have done nothing really new here we have just stated the whole thing again in terms of distance to just emphasize how important the notion of distance is in defining these things and again a similar thing will hold for continuity so we say that f i to r is continuous at c if for any epsilon greater than 0 there exists a delta greater than 0 so that the following implication holds which is distance of x from c less than delta implies that distance of f of x from f of c is less than epsilon so it's really important to get this into our concept that everything here from now on is going to be formulated in terms of distance so it, it's no doubt that it's if we want to extend this notion further we have to attack this notion of distance and try to uh extend it to a more general setting where we deal with more uh, i mean uh, arbitrary sets so now we do so by preserving some natural properties of the familiar distance function on r we preserve some intuitive properties that we know of distance so what we do is in a more generalized setting in a more arbitrary setting we call the distance function a metric so a metric is nothing but a distance function that can be put on any arbitrary set so we are just extending this notion of distance and we are putting and we are equipping any arbitrary set with a general distance function so it could be any set so we'll start with a definition so we'll get formal here since we're introducing something new and that is given a non p set x a metric on x is a function this is an extension of the distance function so the function will be given by d from x cross x oh my god that's a bit messy from x cross yeah that's not better either x cross x to r satisfying oh sorry r plus r plus mean zero satisfying so as i said we try to preserve some natural properties and notions of distance from our real world and from the the natural distance that we have been using in r so some of the properties that we preserve are the fact that distance of x y can be zero only if x and y are the same point so d of x y equal to zero implies that x is equal to y and the reverse implication must hold too so if two things have a distance of zero they are the same and if two things are the same they must have a distance of zero so that is what that is the first axiom of a metric the second being distance is commutative so distance of x comma y will be the same as distance of y comma x this is again another very natural notion that we intend to preserve and the third is a uh, rather a bit more abstract notion but it will makes obvious sense once i've stated it fully so the distance between x and y must be lesser than or equal to the distance between x and z plus distance between z and y and this is your familiar triangle inequality
of course we can take like it is more or less up to us to choose which natural properties of the distance to preserve uh, into the as we extend it to the metric and which to reject so we we generally choose these three axioms to represent a metric and obviously the third one seems pretty fair a pretty fair assumption now considering in the real line that if we have any two points uh, the only time when this equality in the third point is satisfied is when it lies on the line joining the two points so we uh, assume that the triangle inequality is a natural notion of distance and we preserve it and add it as the third axiom for a metric so these so basically any non empty set equipped with such a distance function that gives a, a positive real num sorry a non negative real number between any two points which signifies the distance between those two points is known as a metric and that metric must satisfy these three axioms that we have laid out over here so if a set x is equipped to the matrix sorry is equipped with a metric if a set x is equipped with a metric then x comma d is said to be a metric space now in this process of okay i think one more question sorry so in this process of trying to uh, extend this whole concept of analysis to more and more arbitrary sets uh, you might ask whether a metric can be defined on any set so obviously as you'll see that uh, the fact that a metric actually does not depend on the nature of a set it might at most depend on the cardinality of the set because a metric is completely independent whether of the fact that whether a set is a group whether it has the least upper bound property whether it has addition imposed on it whether it has multiplication whether it's abelian or whatever so it at as in the worst case it can only depend on the cardinality of the set and fortunately it doesn't even depend on that so a set any set can be equipped with a metric and we can it can be equipped with one of the most trivial metrics as we will see later on so i'll give some examples of metric spaces to get the concept a bit more clear so let's look at some examples let's see the first one would be naturally r under the standard metric the standard metric so here we define distance between any two real numbers x and y as mod the modulus of their difference right so this was a fairly natural metric on r again if you might guess we can define a similarly uh, natural metric on rn so if you consider rn there is something called the euclidean metric euclidean metric. and this as you might have guessed is basically the distance between two two points of rn x1 till xn comma y1 till yn will be given by the square root of x1 y1 whole square plus whole square so this is again a pretty familiar metric that we are we have seen a lot of times before now there are several generalizations of this very metric itself and one is the lp metric so r n under the lp in this case the distance between two points x1 and y1 to yn will be given by nothing but x1 minus y1 plus p plus oh i'm sorry this should have been xn Plus 
x n minus y n over p to the pth root. And this LP metric is a metric for every uh, non-negative real number p. And of course, one must have one must try to verify the three axioms of the metric space before confirming that it is in fact a metric. So another metric that we can give for Rn is known as the L infinity metric. Rn under the L infinity metric. And this is a fairly simple metric. The L infinity metric will look like distance between x1, xn, and y1. yn will be given by the maximum of mod x1 minus y1. Mod x2 minus y2. Again, I will not get into verifying that these are metrics. I mean, the first two axioms of the metric space are trivial. The fact that this is commutative and that uh, it is equal to zero if and only if the two points are same. But, oh, I'm sorry, this was actually minimum. Yeah. The minimum of the component wise absolute value difference. So as you can see, even the natural metric under R, uh, which was the absolute value of, the, of their differences, that also counts as an LP metric. And that is the L1 metric. So now uh, we can try to move away from Rn since Rn is not a very great development from R. We can try to impose a metric on almost any set. So let's take an arbitrary set. So let's take something like X given by ABC, a trivial three element set. We can define a metric on this too. And that could be something like D from X cross X to X given by distance between AB is one, distance between BC is two, and distance between AC is three. Again, it verifies, and of course, distance, distance between X, X is zero for all X belonging to X, of course. And you, it can be trivially verified again that this does define a metric on this set. So essentially, we have taken a very, a very unexpected set like ABC, and we have been able to define a measure of closeness on this. So we can actually start doing, uh, uh, we can start discussing things like continuous functions and convergence on a seemingly non-important set like ABC2. And as I mentioned before, that a metric can be imposed on any set we come to one such metric, which can be imposed. And that is the discrete metric. So let X be an arbitrary set. And this is a rather simple metric, which we define. So it's from DX cross X to X. And the definition is dx comma y is zero if x is equal to y, which is trivial since it follows from the first axiom, and it's one otherwise. So this, I'm sorry, yeah. So this distance value is, uh, I mean. It is. It still satisfies the axioms of a metric space, but it's a rather nonsensical one because it's only zero when the points are the same, and it's the same for all other distinct points. So it's one e otherwise. So in fact, this metric can even be imposed on R. So basically, e, if imposed on R, if imposed on R we get that the distance of zero and five is one. The distance of five and six is one. Distance of five and five 
is zero and so on so it seems rather nonsensical but it is essential to defend since it basically validates the fact that any set can be equipped with a metric and that is really special because once you equip a set with a metric you can do a whole lot of uh, stuff related to analysis on that set so another couple of more interesting examples of metrics just to get that idea that we can put a metric on on, on every set it does not have to be the real numbers the complex numbers or whatever so we can again take just r plus and we can give the metric we can define d x comma y by d of x comma y equal to modulus of log y minus log x this is also a metric and this is a metric on the positive real numbers so even if we have a set such as the real numbers we have already seen how we can give three distinct metrics to that set so any set can be given more than one metric and it's pretty obvious that once we consider this discrete metric that we have defined before we can always instead of uh, we can always say that instead of keeping the distance as one if x is not equal to y we can just scale it up and keep it like let's say pi it can be almost any real number i mean it can be every real number that we can think of so scaling the metric doesn't really affect it much here we have just scaled the metric up by a factor of pi so so uh, it's trivial to notice that once we are allowed to do this there is practically an infinite number of metrics that one can impose on a given set so now one more example would be uh, if we consider the set x let x be a set and let m be a metric space then we can define a metric on the set s given by the functions from x to m such that f is bounded and here what does bounded mean so we know that m is a metric space so m is a metric space we can define a quantity known as the diameter of m to be the supremum of all distances between any two arbitrary points in m so if our space was if our set was something like let's say a four point set uh, a b c t then we would basically just consider the set distance of a b distance of b c distance of c d and so on uh, it would be 4 cubes to that six elements and we would take the supremum of this and that is what we define to be the diameter it is the maximum separation between any two points of the given set so we say that uh, f is bounded we say that f is bounded if fx has a finite diameter f here i use the capital x so fx is the set containing all fx such that x belong to x so we say that it's bounded if f of x as a whole set as in f applied on that whole set has a finite diameter so again i'll come back to the definition of the set s that was the set of all functions from x to m such that f is bounded if we consider this set then we can give a metric on this set a set of functions given by df comma g which is the supremum among all x in x of d f of x comma g of x. 
okay uh, actually we'll denote this metric by capital d and this is the metric on m so we are basically taking the supremum of the distance between the two function values as it ranges over the domain and we use small d as it is the metric on m which was already stated to be a metric space and the fact the conclusion is that this whole thing that the capital d that we just defined on a space of functions also serves as a metric so again you can put a metric on almost i mean on every set possible so and now we come to a rather trivial example a subset of a metric space with the restriction of the metric to itself is again a metric space so if we took r with the natural metric that is dx comma y is given by mod of x minus y we can just restrict this metric so we'll call that a dr a restriction metric from we can restrict it to the non negative or the positive reals so we can define dr from r plus to r plus to r given by uh given by dr of x comma y equal to d of x comma y and restrict and restricting this metric still preserves the same uh, axioms of the metric and hence leads to a metric space structure for the subspace so now that we have come across some Come, come across the definition of a metric space we can define some important notions for that are important within the metric space itself so let's uh, start by some running assumptions that wait definition so we assume that x is a metric space with a metric d so we first define something called the r ball so the r ball of radius r centered at some point x in x is basically is given by n r of x which is the set of all points that are closer to x than r so it is basically all the y that lie in x that lie inside the r radius region of x so the x y less than r so this is again uh Uh, analogous to an open ball in rn because an open ball in rn is nothing but uh, an r ball a special case of an r ball when applied so if we take r2 and we ask what is the r ball what is the five ball around 0, 0 that is nothing but the open set the open circle around 0, 0 that is of radius 5 so it's basically the set x comma y such that x square plus y square is less than 5 uh, so it's a very special case of the notion of an r ball secondly uh if e shouldn't it be less than 25 oh my bad so we'll do a square root here yeah so my bad thank you if e is a subset of x and so as you know 
uh, for subsets of x we can again restrict the metric and uh, create separate metric spaces for them so here e will also be a metric space under the restricted metric on x which is the restriction of d and if y belongs to x then y is said to be a limit point of e if every open ball open r ball centered at y inter E minus y. So we'll get into why this definition is presented this way. So you might have encountered the notion of a limit points in uh, in your analysis one course, and that basically says that if you have any subset of R, if uh, I is a subset of r a belong to r is a limit point of i if there is a sequence in i that converges to a and this exact same reasoning carries on towards to the metric space definition of a limit point. So if we had a subset, so let us say we had a set X and we had a subset E within X and we had a point, let's say Y over here. And we say that Y is a limit point of, when we say that Y is a limit point of E, we take two cases. So if If y belongs to E, then uh, it is all right. Actually, I'll take the case where y doesn't belong to E. If y doesn't belong to E, then we should get a sequence of uh, points in E that converge to y. There should exist E1 a sequence that belongs that lies in E, so that E i converges to y, and this is just stated differently as every open neighbor, every ball around Y intersects E. So e in, I'll, draw, I'll just draw this diagram bigger. If this is E and we said Y is outside here, and if it was not a limit point, then you would always be able to find a ball such that it does not intersect E. So there is a point there. So we can say that there is no sequence in E that comes and converges to Y. So this is just an alternate way of saying that there is a sequence in E that comes and converges to Y. But we say in our definition for the limit point, we say that it must intersect E minus Y. And that is important since if Y belong to E, it does not necessarily mean that y is a limit point of e. We may just consider the set uh, given on R2, given by this circle and the and the point here. Let's say this is the unit circle and the point uh, 5 comma 0. Obviously, 5, 5 comma 0 is not a limit point of this whole set. This whole set, wait, let's, what is the set? Let's denote it as s equal to x comma y such that x square plus y square equal to 1 union 5 comma 0. If s is the set, then 5 comma 0 is not a limit point of s. Since I can take a neighborhood of 5 comma 0 that does not intersect s minus 5 comma 0 and s minus 5 comma 0 is basically the unit circle so x comma y such that x square plus y square equal to 1 so in this case 
even though the point lies in the set that we are talking about we have the case that uh, uh, there are neighborhoods around 5.0 that do not intersect a, the set that contains it with the removal of 5.0 itself so it's necessary in our definition to state that uh, every open ball around the around y must intersect e minus y and that, only that makes y a limit point of uh, e in the general setting so now that uh, we we see how a limit point is analogous to that in defined in real analysis we can define what it means to be close so as again our standing assumption is that e is a subset of x and then e is said to be closed if e contains all its limit points so this is again analogous to closed intervals introduced in r so closed intervals are bounded on both sides and they contain their extreme points so in this case too e is defined to be closed if e contains all its limit points so and in a more generalized setting e need not have just two extreme points it could spread out in all directions it could have an infinite number of extreme points it just has to contain all its limit points and if it does e is said to be closed so every seek if e is closed and there is a sequence in e that converges to some point in x so therefore if there is a sequence e1 in e that uh, that converges to some x in x then it is of necessity that x must belong to e itself since e is closed so this it can be thought as closed under convergence so if there is any convergent sequence within e it must converge to a point in e itself it cannot converge to a point outside e. so that defines closedness and last i think there'll be uh, one more definition left after this so if y belong to e is said to be an interior point if and only if there exists an open r ball n r y centered at y so that n r y is a subset of e so if we had a set on r2 where where y lies on the boundary in that case we cannot say that y is an interior point of e because any r ball that we take no matter how small or how big will always have a region outside the boundary so to lie at the interior it is necessary that you have an r ball such that you have a neighborhood that is entirely contained within that set so if we considered again the Uh, open circle uh, given by the the open unit circle then in this case every point in this unit circle is an interior point and since it's open it does not contain its own boundary so it does not have any non interior point so uh, uh, again in this setting an open set will not be the opposite of a closed set since the definitions are two completely separate things one deals with a set containing all its limiting points and the other deals with a set containing points that are the a set containing points such that all its points lie in the interior so we define an open set e subset of x is said to be open if every x belonging to e is an interior point of e. of e
and uh this is again fairly obvious since uh if we deal if we consider some open sets in r2 they will all be of they'll either be uh like continuous shapes that have an open boundary or unions of such continuous shapes that have open boundaries so when you have an open boundary every set every point in that set that we have has a neighborhood that is contained entirely within the shape that we are talking about so all these are these i mean this is a basic classification of all the open sets in e so now a lot of the properties of closed and open sets are analogous to those of closed and open intervals in r again open intervals in r are bounded on both sides so if we have ab on r and we have ab in this form it's bounded on both sides and every point in this interval for no matter how close to the extreme you can always find another neighborhood such that it is contained entirely within this interval since it does not contain the point at the boundaries if it did then it would no longer be open since the boundary points have no for any neighborhood around the boundary points one half of the neighborhood will always lie outside the open interval containing it so as you can see these are again uh, analogous to closed and open intervals in r so now using the this terminology we proceed to state and prove two rather elementary results that will help us better understand closed and open sets so the first result is that every r ball centered around x is an open set containing x well, this is fairly trivial so uh, if x is our metric space and n r x oh, and x belongs to x n r x is an r ball entered around x then we basically have x and the ball that surrounds it so to prove that it's open we must show that for any y to show for any y in this r ball there exists a neighborhood delta of y such that it is contained completely within this nrx so that is rather trivial so let us assume uh, there exists a arbitrary y in nrx let y belong to nr of x and we assume that distance we assume d of x and y equal to delta so this distance will be delta again uh, although this looks like i am proving the theorem specifically for r2 if you follow the proof along the whole way it holds for any general setting of a metric space most metric spaces cannot be drawn because the notion of distance is very confusing there so if we assume that uh, if we suppose that the distance between x and y is delta then we can see that uh, if we construct if we let epsilon be equal to r minus delta by 2 in that case we will have that n epsilon of y is another open ball containing y and it is completely contained inside n r of x since r minus delta is basically the distance between y and this uh, like fictitious boundary that we have drawn and if we half that we'll have that this the open ball of that length will never escape that boundary so once we draw that open ball it's completely contained within this original open ball that we wanted it to be in. so we come to the conclusion that every r ball centered around x is an open ball uh, is an open set containing x and the second theorem oh, and before i proceed to the second theorem i need to define a neighborhood 
a neighborhood of x is any open set u that contains x it a since it contains x a uh, neighborhood of x could also be an r ball centered around x it could even be an r ball that contains x but is not centered around x just like y was contained in this r ball centered around x but the ball wasn't centered around y so it does not necessarily mean that a neighborhood is a ball it could be any open set that is contain that uh, contains x so now we come to the second theorem if y is a limit point of if y is a limit point of some space e which is a subset of x then any r ball centered around y contains infinitely many points of e and this again is a result that we'll just pon we'll just probe into it a bit deeply and to get a better understanding of the whole thing going on here so it basically says that if i had a limit point of some subspace i already know that every r ball around that limit point must intersect e uh, uh, in a non empty way because it's a limit point of e so we already know that every r ball centered at y must intersect e since since the since y is a limit point of e so therefore if there was a single r ball that didn't intersect e then you will not have a convergent sequence towards y anymore because you have a neighborhood of y that does not contain any element from e so every neighborhood smaller than that neighborhood will contain no elements from e and hence y cannot be a limit point because no sequence of points from e can then approach y so we know this but we as we have to prove that it contains infinitely many points so we assume the contrary the contrary so let n r of y be an r ball such that n r of y intersects e its intersection with e is finite and let that intersection be x1 till xn so now we have that we have that uh, n r of y with uh, n r y's intersection with e it contains only a finite number of points so in this case we'll try to disprove that y is a limit point of e so we can consider the minimum the minima of the set dy comma x1 dy comma xn since what we basically have is we have a ball around y and the only intersections with e are at a finite number of points so if this minima if we can get this minima and uh, assume delta is the minima of dy comma x1 till dy comma xn then this delta is basically the closest point of e this delta is basically the closest distance between y and e so you can already see where this is going wrong because if 
y is a limit point of e we cannot define a closest distance the distance keeps converging to zero and obviously this delta will not be zero because x i's are distinct from y and since it's a finite set the minima will be a non zero number so once you have this we can just consider the delta by 2 ball centered around y which will not consider any which will not contain any of the x i's and hence it has a uh, empty intersection with e so n delta by 2 of y's intersection with e will be empty which means y is not a limit point of e and as a trivial corollary a finite set has no limit point if e is finite it cannot have any limit point so as you can already see by defining this metric and defining the notion of limit points we have already developed and extended the notion of convergence to more arbitrary sets so if we have a metric space in which a sequence converges to another uh, the point in the metric space then we define that point to be a limit point so i'll just give a few examples to solidify these notions of open sets and closed sets so let's consider the following subsets of r so wait so let's first consider the set uh, uh let's say x comma y belongs to r2 such that mod no mod let's say root x square plus y square less than 1 uh, okay so this is basically the open unit circle in r so is this open yes it's definitely open since this is again an open ball centered around 0, 0 so it will and from theorem 1 it states that every open ball is an open set in the metric space so it's open is it closed well can be closed because obviously 1, 0 does not belong in this and 1, 0 is a limit point i am not getting into the rigorous proofs that one of stuff like whether 1, 0 is a limit point or not but you get the general idea so it's not closed and this is of course uh, bounded since it has a finite diameter and here we can even calculate the diameter which is 2 since the farthest distance between any two points is when they are uh, at the opposite ends of course in this set we can't have two points at the opposite ends but the supremum approaches two so it is bounded the second time let's let's consider a second example let let's consider the set xy in r2 where root of x square plus y square is less than or equal to 1 so in this case we we get the whole circle and it includes the boundary 2 so in this case it can no longer be open since from the previous case we can again use 1,0 as our counter example if it was open then every we would be able to find a neighborhood of 1,0 that lies completely within this but in this case every neighborhood around 1,0 has half the neighborhood lying outside this circle so it's not open this is trivially closed since the only limit points it contains all its limit points if there is any point outside uh, if there is any point outside that serves as a limit point then its distance should be greater than 1 and you cannot and all these distances are less than or equal to 1 so you cannot approach a distance greater than 1 in that way so this is closed and again this is bounded okay uh, we can consider another subset of r2 given by let's say 1, 0 2, 0 
and uh, 3 comma 5 in this case again this is definitely not open because this set basically looks like 1 comma 0 2 comma 0 and 3 comma 5 here no neighborhood around 1 comma 0 lies completely within this set itself so it's not open is it closed yes this is trivially closed since we discussed before that finite sets cannot have limit points so this is a finite set since it has only three elements and it's so it cannot contain and since it does not contain any limit points it's vacuously closed so this is definitely closed and it's bounded definitely since it is a finite set so there are only uh, three combinations of distances and the supremum will hence be finite now as a fourth example let's consider the integers embedded inside r2 so basically points of the form n comma zero where n belongs to z so this is basically this x-axis and all the lattice points on the x-axis so well yeah so is this open again from the previous example it's not because here there is no boundary uh, if we take the point 0 comma 0 uh, any uh, r ball around 0 comma 0 is not contained inside this set of integers so this is not open is this closed yes this will be closed because again even though it's an infinite set it contains no limit points contains no limit points so it is closed but it's unbounded trivial since it stretches to both infinities across and finally let's consider the set um what should we consider let's just consider the set one by n comma zero n belongs to z plus so what does this look like we have one by one by two by three so on so this again is not open since okay this again these are all subsets of r2 so this is not open since one comma one again doesn't contain uh sorry one comma zero doesn't contain a neighborhood that is completely contained within this set so not open this is not closed either because as you can obviously see zero is a limit point for this set however zero is not included in this set so it's not closed so we finally arrive at a set which is neither open nor closed and this is definitely bounded since it all lies within the closed interval 0 comma 1 this whole set is contained within that so we have an example of a set that is not closed or open either and we can consider well trivially the whole space r2 that is open since any open neighborhood of an element in r2 is again contained wholly inside r2 so it's open R2 again will not have any limit points. Every point, because every set, every point that we're talking about R2 as a subspace of R2 is contained within R2 again. So all its limit points will also be contained in R2. So this is closed too. So we have reached an opposite example of a metric space that is both open and closed. We refer to these spaces as clopen. Uh, we will come to this later and definitely this isn't bounded so it's an unbounded space so it's important to note here that a set may be either open or closed or both or neither in a metric space the uh, open and closed sets aren't opposites of each other they convey different topological properties of the set and a set that is open with respect to one metric space may not be open with respect to another so we'll come to a come we'll come to an example for that if i consider the segment a b in r2 one question yeah do we have non-trivial examples of open sets closed and open at the same time i mean not the whole metric space uh yes 
so one second let me just think about that hmm. yeah so i think if we take r2 again and uh, let's just say we take you know what uh, two closed circles that are disjoint if we take two closed circles that are disjoint in in that case we should actually no okay wait that will not be an example one second just give me a minute okay so we have we do have examples like that so again i'll get back to this thing so if it's r2 and but i in this example you shouldn't consider r2 as a parent space r2 is not the parent space let's just take um what shall we take so let's just take okay so take a segment in r2 i mean not a segment a plane right and take two closed circles within the plane and let us say actually just take three closed circles right and okay this is a rather horrible drawing so let's formalize this a bit more so one second yeah so our parent space x will be a sequence a series of three closed circles so it will be um x comma y such that x square plus y square equal to 1 union x comma y such that um what else such that x minus 1 whole square plus y square equal to 1 union x minus x comma y such that x minus 2 whole square plus y square equal to 1 uh, can you visualize this so not being able to draw straight lines here okay so fine this should do i guess the first set is just the unit circle centered at 0 comma 0 right and it will hit one comma zero here. The second is nothing but a unit circle shifted to the right by one unit. So that will be. I'll draw it with a different color. Over here, and the third will be the unit circle shifted here. Right. So. yeah that was a mistake let's keep the third one shifted by shifted to x equal to 3 that should be better x minus 3 whole square yeah so where will that go that will go somewhere here i believe yeah okay so it's a pretty asymmetric kind of unit setup but we'll see why so this is our parent space the region within these three circles so let's just put dots there to represent so you have to forget about r2 and obviously you can do this because any set can be end out with a metric so we start with this set itself and we end out it with the natural metric now the thing what we try to do over here is in this, are we keeping uh, all the point inside the circles 
yeah all the points inside the circles and the boundary too then those yeah, those will be the inequalities less than or equal to 1 yeah it will be oh my bad that's yeah thanks how about it Wait, I feel I made a mistake again. But okay, wait. You know what? Let's not get too much into the formality then. I think I got it now. So one second. Yeah. Okay. So just take R two, and I'm just using R two to draw the circles. So forget about its uh, structure later on. So take one closed circle here, one closed circle here. and one closed circle here right call them a b c so they are all disjoint yes so now if this is our parent set a union b union c is your parent set now the thing is let's just consider the derived matrix space that comes as a union c a union c which is a subset of uh a union b union c so now since we are forgetting r2 it will just look like three circles that were there originally and what we do is we okay if these were the original circles uh i'll just draw the set we are considering in red so the set we are just considering is a union c so that we'll draw it in red like this now the thing is this this a union c it is trivially closed obviously right since any limit point uh, lies in, 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 within this circle only now to show that it's open the interesting thing what we did here was we consider the parent space to be the three circles originally so if so if you have so we now we can see that all the points here they have a neighborhood that completely lies within the set so trivially if i take a point in the interior of any one of these two circles yeah it obviously has a neighborhood that lies within this thing but now you'll say okay but what about the point on this boundary it what about its neighborhood this neighborhood this part doesn't lie within but that's the thing we never took r2 as the parent space the parent space was the three circles only and so if we take this part of this thing it is not actually included in the parent space itself it's not part of the boundary it's not part of the open ball the so the open ball is essentially only this part and that is trivially contained inside because none of this part on the outer side uh, which i'll let's say how do i shade that yeah none of this part shaded with green actually belongs to Uh, the parent space at all so when we actually have the open ball we only consider the open ball that is part of the parent space originally so here it, the it points on the boundaries they have open neighborhoods contained completely within the set itself so this is an example of a completely uh, clopen system of subsets of the parent space so uh, i mean did i clear that i don't think i cleared it like i don't uh, this was a bit too abstract did i clear that clear. thanks yeah yeah so again what is contained within an open set is completely defined by how you define the parent space so i, I was coming to this last example i i think if i do this last example and then come back to this it will be even more clearer so uh one second uh let me think of something where the openness is relative so okay yeah so perfect let's just consider r2 right and we consider the line segment ab embedded within r2 so what does that look like that looks like this right uh, ab so now if if r2 is the parent space then this is not open if r2 is the parent space 
then a b is not open since i can take a point over here and uh, let's just say i take the midpoint right a plus b by 2 yeah that's much easier i just take the midpoint and no matter what neighborhood i draw there will always be this region these two regions lying outside these two open hemispheres that lie outside the segment ab so it is never fully contained inside ab so it is not open but if our parent space was just r if our parent space was just r in which case the metric is the usual uh, x minus y metric in that case what does the open set look like you cannot draw the whole circle in the case of r because these points don't even make sense since the parent set is r you cannot have points that lie outside r because in that case i can uh, i can take something in r3 uh, in the cartesian r3 uh, 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 space and i can take a three dimensional object and then say no this is still not an open set because if you consider a fourth axis then a lot of these parts would be lying outside that fourth axis and all that so it always depends on the parent space here so in r when r is our parent space the open neighborhood will not look like this circle the open neighborhood will again just look like an open interval over here because you have changed the metric completely over here so the neighborhood also changes it only the neighborhood can cannot contain any point outside the original parent space given to it so this is one example where a set is open with respect to one space with one parent space and it is not open with respect to another and this is what we have done exactly over here in the case of these three circles it they wouldn't have been open if we considered the parent space as r2 but since we considered the parent space as the three circles initially we cannot make any sense of this space outside in this uh, open boundary of the point along the border so that allows us to have a clopen set in this case uh, does it clarify the thing a bit more yes it's okay, okay. i'll okay so so a set that is uh, open with respect to one metric space need not be open with respect to another and this holds for like the uh, closed metric space also as a further example if my space x is the closed circle or the open circle if x itself is the set x square plus y square i mean sorry, not the set x square plus y square but the set x y such that x square plus y square equal to 1 then it's basically this open circle here and this is definitely closed since my parent space itself is the whole space that i'm considering so i cannot i honestly cannot talk about a limit point anymore because every point is contained within it but instead if x was r and then y was this set in that case the story changes completely because sorry r2 in that case we have r2 and then we have this set y and of course it contains limit points because now you actually have points outside this in the first case you cannot talk points outside this because this is your entire parent space itself so you cannot talk about points that are outside your parent space and it there is a pretty good reason to do this also because if you were allowed to talk about points outside your parent space then in reality you will never have an open set because no matter what set you define you can always just say oh there is a parent that you have uh, an arbitrary extension abc of the parent space which is not contained inside this it's not just axes right you could have r2 and then you could say since we are not talking about parent spaces i could just say abc should also be a part of the uh, underlying space and then even if you include abc i can give you a1 b1 c1 a2 b2 c2 like that so there's no limit to where you'll stop after that so that's why uh, on the whole discussion of closeness and openness should be restricted to uh, the parent space itself so i hope that settles it so even though open and closed sets don't share a like a proper zero one relation because they are not opposites because since they convey two different pieces of information we still have 
the fact that open and closed sets possess a significant connection between them and that is that is let's take this there is the third result that if x is a metric space and u is open in x then u complement must be closed in y oh sorry in x my bad in x and vice versa so if you had some space x and your u was open in x uh, our claim is that u complement must be closed in x so let us uh, assume uh, let let how do we go about proving that u complement is closed in x we must show that u complement contains all its limit points so let y be let y be a limit point of u complement so let y belong to x be a limit point of u complement so what we have now is that there is a sequence of points in u complement that approaches y so if we assume the contrary if y does not belong to u complement that will mean y belongs to u but now we know that u is open so there is a neighborhood of y so if y is here there is a neighborhood of y that is contained completely in u so nry there is some r such that nry is contained completely in u since u is open and y belongs to u but now that means you can no longer have a sequence of points since we since uh, y is a limit point of u every neighborhood every neighborhood of y sorry of y must intersect u complement since it's a limit point of u complement right so every neighborhood of y must intersect u complement but we know that nry is a neighborhood of y and it's contained completely inside u so nry subset of u must intersect u complement which is a contradiction since u cannot ever intersect u complement so therefore y must belong to u complement so every limit point so u complement contains all its limit points and that proves the forward direction now for the backward direction if the backward direction basically says that if c is closed in x then c complement is open in x right so let's assume that uh, it's false so uh, uh, how do we uh, how do we give a con uh, how do we assume a contrary statement to this so uh, we basically want to prove that c complement is open in x so we can just as a contrary assume the contrary so let x belong to c complement such that every neighborhood neighborhood of x has a point outside c complement yeah so if it was open then every neighborhood would be con completely contained within c complement so this uh, the uh, the contradiction i mean the negative of the statement is that every neighborhood has some at least one point outside c complement but if that is true then then every neighborhood of x intersects c c minus x since x is in c complement so it, it if it's outside c complement it's in c 
So every neighborhood of X intersects C minus X, which implies X is a limit point of C. And since by hypothesis C was closed, C was closed, that implies that X belongs to C, which is a contradiction since we assume that X belongs to C complement. So it's a contradiction. Hence, you have a trivial relation between open and closed sets. And that is open sets are complements of closed sets and closed sets are complements of open sets. So uh, now uh, I, uh, I talked about how uh, openness might not be preserved under different parent spaces. So I'll give a theorem, but I will not prove this although it's rather trivial. So the fourth theorem is that if Y is a subspace, if Y is a submetric space of X and E is a subspace of Y, so that E is open with respect to Y, then E is of the form y intersection u so we have x we have y we have e and it's basically telling e is of the form y intersection u where u is open in x so uh, this is basically giving the classification for uh, sets that are open in a subspace in a submetric space of a parent metric space. So in, if uh, so if a, if a space, I mean, if a set is open within a metric space, I mean, if it's open within a submetric space, then it must be of the form of that submetric space intersecting with an open set of the parent metric space itself. And uh, I will not prove this, although it is not very hard to prove. Uh, from what we have discussed previously and another this one will be important an arbitrary union union of open sets is open so that's part one. It's actually a theorem in four parts. So let's see. So let X be a metric space and let U, okay. So when I say arbitrary union, it doesn't have to be union of U1, U2, U3. It could be an uncountable union. It could be a union of any cardinal. So it's not necessary that our open sets will be of the form u1, u2, u3. So it will be of the form u alpha. It's indexed by alpha, where alpha lies in some indexing set i. So let u alpha be a collection of open sets of x. What we have is union as alpha goes over i of u alpha is also open in X and the proof for that is again so if uh, let us say X belongs to this union as alpha goes over I of U of alpha then X must belong to some U of uh, let's say A for some A belongs to I since it's part of the union so uh, there exists a neighborhood NR of X that is contained completely in UA, which is again contained completely in the whole union of alpha belongs to U alpha. So, so, my bad. So that implies there is a neighborhood of X that is contained completely in this union alpha belongs to I of U alpha, hence making this open. So uh, that is the proof for arbitrary unions. And now, uh, yeah. 
So now we also have one more uh, theorem related to the intersections of open sets. If u1 to u n is a finite, so this is the second part of u, is a finite collection of open sets of x, then intersection i equal to 1 n u i is an open set of x. And it has to be emphasized this that this works only when it's finite. I mean, the previous case was for any arbitrary union, finite, infinite, countable, uncountable, whatever. But this one only works, I mean, this one works for the finite case because there are many uh, cases where it doesn't work for the infinite case and all that. And obviously, we'll see the reason in the proof too. So, so what we do is let x belong to this. We basically want to show that this intersection is open. So we consider an arbitrary point in this intersection, i equal to 1 to n intersection of ui. So uh, we that, so if x belongs to the intersection, then x belongs to ui for all i belongs to 1 to n. So now that we have that, we have there are neighborhoods n r i centered at x that are contained in each of the UN. And now we could take R0 as the minimum of R1, R2, Rn. And therefore, N R0 X will be a subset of UI for all I belong to, to N, which implies N R0 of X lies in this intersection i equal to 1 to n ui which implies intersection i equal to 1 and ui is open now the problem here is that we cannot apply the same logic to arbitrary uh, intersection because what we did here uh, when we did r not equal to minimum of r1 r2 till rn is that we assumed that this minimum will not go to zero and why that i mean that was a safe assumption because r1 r2 till rn is a finite set and each of these are greater than zero so the actually yeah so the minimum also of a finite set uh, of positive elements is all is always a positive element since the set is finite but if it's an infinite set we might as well as have had that r1 was equal to one r2 was equal to half and so on in this case, we won't have a positive minimum. We, the minimum will be zero if we go along the same path. In which case, it can't be a valid open neighborhood because the radius has to be positive. That's why it was a necessity that it's a finite collection for the intersection. And similarly, we have the third and fourth part, which I won't prove because now that we know that open and closed sets are complements of each other, it can be trivially proved. So if C alpha, again, alpha belongs to I, is a collection of closed sets of X, then it is closed under arbitrary intersections. So alpha belongs to I, C alpha is closed in X. And similarly, we have if C1, Cn is a finite collection of open, oh, sorry, of closed sets of X, then the union I equal to 1 to N of Ci is closed in X. So again, I'll give two, I mean, I'll give two examples to emphasize on the ne necessity for the finiteness condition. So if we considered uh, sets of the form Gn given by minus one by n open to one by n, which are open in R, then uh, we each of these is open in R and n runs obviously from one to 
what a the whole natural number okay so n belongs to the natural numbers so yeah but we have intersection n equal to 1 to infinity of gn is equal to 0 since each of these sets the first set will be minus 1 to 1 oh, my bad the first set will be minus 1 to 1 the second will be minus half to half the third will be minus 1/3 to 1/3 so as this intersection this goes on this infinite intersection will be zero but this is not open in r so the finiteness condition was very necessary for this uh, theorem on unions and intersections so now as a general remark as you have already seen for a uh, metric space x comma d phi and the phi of which is the null set in x which is obviously again a metric space since it's a subset phi and x are always all oh, oh. phi and x are always both closed and open all right so now uh we'll uh we'll introduce something known as the closure of a set so so if x comma d is a metric space and e is some subset of x let e dash denote all the limit points of e in x so we know that a space need not necessarily always contain all its limit points in fact it's not a zero one thing it could contain some of its limit points and it could not contain some of its limit points etc so e dash is basically the set of all limit points of e in x then then we define the closure e bar of e as e union all its limit points so it's the set that contains e and all the limit points that contain e also so then we have the following properties of e closure then we have e closure is closed and e closure is the smallest closed set containing e so a closure essentially takes the bare minimum and the necessary points and it adds them to e just enough to make it a closed set so e closure is the smallest closed set containing e so uh now i think we can go on and define a general notion of a sequence and that of convergence in a metric space so let's start with the sequences so uh okay. let x be a metric space let x be a metric space a uh, sequence xn in x is a uh, is a map f from it the map f from the natural numbers to x uh, this is a rather abstract way of 
stating what the sequence is, but it's basically assigned to every natural number, it assigns a point from X, uh, making a sequence. So now that we have what a sequence is, we can move on and define convergence. A sequence Xn in X is said to converge to a point x in x if for any epsilon greater than 0 there exists a delta greater than 0 so that sorry not a delta a natural number n so that distance between x n and x is less than epsilon for all n greater than or sorry, for all small n greater than or equal to capital. So there is literally almost no difference from this definition and the definition used for the real numbers. We have just replaced the fact that x belongs to this interval with the fact that the distance keeps getting less than epsilon. So choose any epsilon, no matter how small, we can always find a point in the sequence after which all points have a distance from the converging point that is less than epsilon. And this defines convergence. So that's a fairly straightforward the, uh, definition of convergence uh, that we have extended to any arbitrary set. So now that we have established the required groundwork that enables us to deal with convergence, we can uh, proceed to uh, define a certain important property of uh, 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 of uh, subsets of metric spaces that we whose properties we can study under continuous functions that help us study continuous functions even better. So we come to a property known as connectedness. So to define connectedness in a metric space, we first define a separation. So 